Every army that ever marched through Ireland has marched past that stone mm. over the last thousand years. So can you imagine a guy coming up here and a, a lot very of angry man? A lot of angry weapon. men have walked through here right. and, and, and looked at that stone and maybe even entered the spleen of it. Right. This, was per this was fairly mobile. You could move yeah, yeah, all yeah, around. You moved that around, yeah. Right, right. Yeah. That that was, that was, um, was, and did it make a lot of noise, do you remember? Uh, no, 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 it was no, a civil no, type no. of noise. Oh, that yeah. Yeah. A civil type <laughs> of noise. Yes, <laughs> that, yeah. we put it that way. A posture is another thing. Hold on a second. You have two posters here, yeah. right? A long one for standing up, I presume, <laughs> right? And a small one for me. And a small one for you. <laughs> I've heard the theory expressed a few times that people who live in flat places, vast plains for example, where the horizon stretches away into infinity, are more inclined to travel. Perhaps because, in their mind's eye also, they see no obstacle in their way. Whereas people whose horizons are close by, because they're surrounded by hills and mountains the corollary goes, are more inward looking, parochial in their mindset, and more inclined to stay at home. I used to think that this theory had some validity about it, until I came to this place. Here you're surrounded by mountains on all sides. Your horizon is rarely more than a few miles away. And yet, I would hazard, the people of this parish, certainly in the past, were the most widely travelled people in the entire country. Their fame as travellers was quite literally worldwide. So much for that theory. Unless, of course, this happens to be the exception that proves the rule because it is in many other respects an exceptional place. Welcome to the parish of Drummond Tea in the south of County Armagh. A more urgent imperative than any notion implanted by the landscape, of course, would be the simple one of survival. The need to make a living and put food on the table. And that, I think, as well as a bit of wonder us, perhaps, fostered the travel instinct in these parts. And that in spite of the fact that the idea of home, or a house at least, is embedded in the name of the place. Drummond Tea means the ridge of the dwelling, and the ridge in question is well connected. An extended limb, really, of that noble upheaval of South Armagh that goes by the name of Slieve Gullion, the mountain that dominates most of the northern horizon. Whereas to the south, it's the brief absence of mountain on the horizon that found fame in centuries past as the gap of the north. The valley pass through which the men of Ulster attacked the rest of the country, or at which they defended themselves from the rest of the country, according to the times that were in it. In 1600, Hugh O'Neill fought Charles Blunt, 8th Baron Mountjoy, to a standstill over the Moiry Pass, as it became known, before O'Neill made a strategic withdrawal, leaving a grateful Mountjoy free to build a stony sentinel, Moiry Castle, the following year. Long before either of those two protagonists were ever heard of, of course, the gloriously vague outlines of ancient demigods and Fianna warriors flitted about the wooded glens wherein the Druids dwelt and built conundrums for us mere mortals of modern times to ponder over. Like the Kilna Sagard stone, maybe, since inscribed by Christian monks, perhaps, who would exercise its pagan past and leave it standing to mark the spot where they also lived and prayed and died. The Kilna Sagard stone has long been a source of fascination for local historian Mick Dunnigan. You tell me this is a man's name. Yeah, a man here. called Chernock. Chernock. Son of Kieran Beck. And he's, it's in memory of him under the patronage of Peter the Apostle. Peter the Apostle. He, d he died sometime around 712, 7, 714. So, I mean, th this was, was this a memorial to him, do you I think? Believe, I believe it was. Like, he was, a, he was a real person. He must have been very important Aye. because uh, to have such a stone that's been preserved all this, all this time. Yeah, yeah. Also, the fact that uh, his death has been recorded in the Book of Armagh. Are we pretty sure that this stone is where it always was? Oh yes, this was a very ancient monastic site, and so important people would have been buried in, in, in this spot. Right, so this is actually the oldest, what you would call Christian stone it's in the, the old, entire country? It's the, it's the oldest known Christian memorial in Ireland. It looks to me as if a bit of it has been chopped off yes, the top, Yes. although there's a cross indented there as well, at the, yeah. the very top as I can see. There is. And it's also suffered a wee bit of, some of it might be accidental damage. Well, apparently there, there is some there's scratches on the side of it. Some people believe are of the Ogham script. 
of the Ogham School. I, I don't know. But there's some of it looks as if it was done with, by a man with a bad temper and an axe in his hand. I, I, probably, <laughs> I think a lot of such individuals passed by this place over the last thousand years. Because we're in a very historic site. Let's Indeed. It, and, you know, we're, this oh. is right in the gap of the north. Indeed. Uh, every army that ever marched through Ireland has marched past that stone mm. over the last thousand years. So can you imagine a guy coming up here and, and a, a very angry man? A lot with, of with a angry weapon. men have walked through here right. and, and, and looked at that stone. I maybe be vented the spleen on it. Right. And, bro- and, and, bro- and broke the blades of the shoulders. Probably, probably did. Kilness Agart means the Church of the Priests. And the sheer number of cross-inscribed circles all over the stone, and the fact that excavations carried out here in the 60s uncovered something like 80 graves in this enclosed space alone, leave no doubt as to the importance and longevity of this monastic site, of which the stone is really the only visible reminder. If these marks were indeed inflicted by irate or idle warriors, then they may well have belonged to the troops of either O'Neill or Mountjoy, who spent a rain-soaked autumn battling over the Maori Pass in the year 1600. It was in the following year that this edifice was erected, with stones, local tradition has it, taken from the aforementioned monastery. It was never meant to be pretty, merely pretty impregnable. I mean, it's a simple enough structure. You know, and and it's quite small when you're up close to it. But there are certain sophistications about it because if you look at that corner, you see how beautifully rounded it actually is. It was well well, well, it was well made. Well built. Indeed it was. Yeah. It was was made to last. And and also like the sheer thickness of the walls. Because they were meant to withstand cannon fire. Whatever, whatever. Whatever, I suppose, you know. So anyway, it it has lasted. And of course it was uh, we know it was Mountjoy who who had it built. And uh, but there was a captain Smith, is yeah, that the case? Captain Anthony Smith was the first uh, commanding officer here. He was here from a certainly 1606 to 1624. Oh, was he here that long? He was here that long, right. and uh, apparently he owned land in the area as well. Right, OK, here we go, in anyway. And he had between 12 and 16 men under his command at different times. Only only 16 men? Well, that was all they, ne- all they needed. In here, they were safe. So they were just here, kind of sentinels, more well, that's than all anything else, right? They were, they, I, were I, pre- they were presence, that's I, all. I, I was just imagining, you know, a big army of 10,000 men coming no, through and somebody no, said, no, ah, but there's a castle up in the hills, was there 12 people in it? Uh, that's we, all we better not go yeah. any further. <laughs> what was all, they were, that's all they needed here. So they were here as an alert party more indeed, than anything indeed. else. Of course, they could always fire uh, weapons from here as Oh, well. yes, they mm. have uh, musket loops all around. Yes. This is cobbled. Would this be original, the original cobbles, do you think? No, I, don't, I don't know. Uh, but uh, d- down here there would have been horses. So this was the stable? This would have been the stable. Right, right. Um, living accommodation would have been the next floor. The next floor. You, see the, you can see the chimney breast there. But it's still quite small. And oh, it, it is, it is. They called everything a castle in those days, didn't yes. they? Yes. It's more a keep, really. I, I, I believe they properly call it a keep. A keep. It doesn't qualify as a castle. OK. But not really. Captain Smith had it up until... Certainly, certainly it's the mid-1620s. Mid-1620s. He, he was... Uh, he made a leaseholder of land here to give him a stake in it. This is and it's also a cost saving exercise. Of course. This is by way of pay? By, well, by way of pay, <laughs> yes. So he, he was here it was a long important, time, it was, was important to him personally. Aye, aye. So he could probably work for nothing. Yeah, but he was here, what? 20 years? He was here for more than 20 years, oh, certainly. 20 years, right, right. Oh, he, he was, he was kind of a commanding officer. He was an old man, but he, he, he probably was. He probably was. So they said to him, you'd kept the castle well, so keep it. Keep it. <laughs> keep it. Look after it That's why it's called a keep the bit, yeah. Yeah. Only the merest suggestion remains of a bone wall that would have surrounded the castle and enclosed a space that brought a little bit of the pale to South Armagh. An artist's impression of life here in the 1600s depicts a state of vigilance and readiness. Captain Smith's long posting at Moiry would have afforded him many an idle moment to gaze across the valley. His view would be much the same as it is today, I'm thinking but wouldn't have included Drummond Tea Chapel, which dominates another bit of high ground. It's nearly as prominent as Sleeve Gullion as it sits on its ridge overlooking the community that gathers at its feet. And that community is making an important statement about itself in the brand new state-of-the-art Drummond Tea Primary School. A confident investment in the future of this parish as a wholesome, richly endowed environment in which to raise a family. 
For all its proximity to Newry, Dundalk and Dublin beyond, and for all the people, goods and traffic that wend their way northward and southward, skirting its hedges and laneways, Drummond Tea is still a rural community, which maintains a pace of life dictated by the seasons, and whose identity and traditions, going back hundreds of years, remain largely intact. But, as I suggested earlier, some of those traditions resulted in many natives of the area spending the best years of their lives far away from drum and tea. The following story, which is absolutely true, touches upon two important traditions in these parts, emigration and pavying. Now, emigration you know about. Pavying may require a bit of explanation, which I'll give you later. You don't need to know what it is to appreciate the story. Patrick Morgan was born in Scotland in the late 1800s and at the age of 10 he moved to Drummond Tea. When he was in his early 20s he found himself in Australia doing a bit of pavying. And one day out in the bush somewhere he met an elderly Australian outbacker and they fell into conversation. Eventually the man asked Patrick where he was from. Well, I'm from Scotland originally, said Patrick. The man looked at him curiously. That's funny, he said. I would have put you no more than half a mile from Drummond Tea Chapel. The old timer was, of course, or had been in a previous existence, a Drummond Tea man himself. He may even have done a bit of pavying. Quite what that entailed, we'll find out when we come back. In years past, when times were tough, many men from Drummond Tea, from Jonesborough, Carrickastick and Carrick Broad and hereabouts, whenever they had the seed sown or the harvest gathered, refused to sit about and bemoan the poor yield that their stony soil would invariably offer. So they would go pavying. A pavy was essentially a door-to-door -door seller of cloth, offcuts for the making of suits or whatever else the household needed. Nothing particularly unusual about that, you might say. But the doors the Pavis called at were not in South Armagh. They were as far away as Canada, Newfoundland, Australia and Tasmania. And the drum and tea Pavis would travel there for several months each year, plying their trade to keep their families back home. It's a practice that these two ladies remember from their childhood and their memories of such times are helped by a collection of items, now mostly antiques, which would have been part of the daily household routine familiar to many of a certain vintage. They're on display outside Elizabeth Murphy's house and were joined by her friend and co-mother-in-law, Rose Byrne. Rose's daughter is married to Elizabeth's son. Sadly, some of these items I remember from my own childhood. If I had a wooden one first, a wooden one? This part here yeah, is wooden? Wood, wood, yeah, right. And there are holes in it to mm. let the water away. But this, we thought we were an easy street when we got the, that glass one. The glass the, one? Yeah. I mean, this really was a useful thing. In oh, it course. was, and it, it did a lot better than the wooden one. You know? Before you had, well, you always had a wooden one, I presume, did you? Did you have anything before that? or? or? No, do, I don't remember anything before that, except the possers. The possers, that's another thing. Hold on, I was yeah. I give you, <laughs> you have two possers here, yeah. right? A long one for standing up, I presume, <laughs> right? And a small one for me. And a small one for you. <laughs> and a pauser, I've never seen this before, yeah. right? This is made of copper, uh, yes. I presume. And the water, soapy water with squelching in the holes. And, so you know, really, this would have been good crack, a really squelchy thing. It would, yes. So you would have had the clothes in. The blankets, so, the heavy clothes. The heavy clothes. Yeah. And what would they be in? Some sort of a big tin bath? Tin, uh, well, this was a tub a at tub, the time. A tub, right, of yeah. some sort. And you just squelch this squelch down. It and then when the water ran dirty, you put clean water and done it again, you know. I see, right. So yeah. this, was like, this was like an early human washing machine. Yeah. Well, that's basically <laughs> yeah. it. Exactly. Yeah. So that would have sudsed it up as well, yeah. coming through yeah. those wee, wee yeah. holes, and then also was used for, for, for um, rinsing uh, yeah. afterwards, mm -hmm. right? That's right. Now, there's another. I know what this is, but... Yeah, you do. It's heavy. That does it. How did you... You didn't, <laughs> you didn't use that. this morning at nine o'clock with that. Get away with that. I guarantee you did not use that. Otherwise, you'd have muscles on <laughs> you. I didn't use that. I didn't. A that tailor. A tailor. A tailor, a tailor. A tailor. Yes. right. Yes. That was seriously yes. heavy, isn't yes, it? Yes, I did. Okay. And you have another iron down here, which... Yes, yeah, that's an ordinary one. An ordinary iron. The housewife's iron. iron. What did you put in there? The heater. There's, There's the, the heater. heater. 
Yeah, put that in the put fire. Put that in your fire and heat it up. It'll be red hot. And you would have two ash. normally. Yes. One in and one in use. So that would have been left in the ashes to get red hot? Red well, hot. Not. Oh, left, yes, you left it with hot. the tongs, I presume, obviously. Yes. Then. There used to be yeah, someone with a whole layer, and they were terrific. You'd poker and you'd put put a bend in the top of it and you could lift them out of that. Oh, right. That was yes, yes. So that goes in there. Yeah. And then you... <laughs> it's hot. Close, close the bottom part, right? We have. We know what these are. These are yes. lovely old kettles. Yes. And uh, this another bigger one. Yes. Everything he had in those days was heavy. You know that's, that? Yes, that's very heavy. That's for, heavy and yes. it can, could have been hot as well when yes. you've been Sometimes lifting they it. They held the heat when the heavy of the way. Yes. yes. Now yes. my mother would have two kettles. Right. One for spring water, as you would call it, for the tea. Right. See, it's hard water, and you, and another one out of a, a local stream for washing up and washing. So that didn't have know, to be so things. pure for, for drinking? No, anymore. and it was easier to use because it was softer water. I see. So the softer the water, the easier it was to get, get suds mm -hmm. yeah. and all that. Yeah, yeah, of course. Even another thing here, even heavier. I'm going to have a bad back by the time I'm finished lifting all these things. <laughs> this is last of all. <laughs> last of all. <laughs> Not quite last of all. Right, so this is the shoemaker's last. Yeah. But people did a lot of their own shoemaking. My father did. Oh, yes. Your own father did, didn't My you? father. And your father as well? Yeah, my, my mother. Your mother too? Mother was the one who did the souls. Right. And so, and so they had quite a lot of skills. You had to have a lot of skills as well to use yes, these things. Yes, they When you get new shoes for school, yeah. first thing that went on would be in rubber soles. Aye, <laughs> and aye. that saved them. Right. And when they were right, you could take them off and put on new soles. And your parents could both, both of them could, could do all that. Yeah. Well, my jobs. father could, yeah. Right, right. Heavy though these implements may have been to use, they were pretty lightweight compared to the kind of ironmongery that Eamon Larkin and Patsy Morgan needed to wield to wrest the living from the fields of drum and tea. Their antecedents would have had to supplement their earnings from pavying as well. Indeed, Patsy is distantly related to the Patrick Morgan in the story I told you earlier. And much as Eamon Larkin loves his native soil, he's very aware of its deficiencies. You might grow uh, in our way 30 hundred weight of barley to the acre now, and that would be an ex a good crop, of, right. a good yield of barley. Right. Whereas you could go across the border and you could go yes. into County Louth. Yeah. That vein, if. if, if Just uh, across the uh, uh, Yeah, it would, would produce maybe three tonnes a day. That's right. right. You know, so you can see, yeah. like, the, 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 the grain basket of Ireland starts mm. the other side of Fork Hill and it ends at West Cork, with the exceptions of the Dublin Mountains <laughs> and all that. You know, you do the shorts through it, it's here. Ha it's, it's heartbreaking. It would be yeah. heartbreaking yeah. when you when you yield. Uh, you have your yield if 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 thirty hundred and you go out there just and that man was yielding three hundred. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. you, uh, so that was the difference. Miles. Yes, yeah. that's the difference. Right? Yeah. Oh, so heartbreaking that. and backbreaking. And the Cooley well. Peninsula. Uh, we'll, we'll be going over to the spuds, but just while it's in my memory, the Cooley Peninsula that could grow twenty tonnes a acre of spuds. Are you serious? Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, that'd be the Irish acre now. Yeah. Well, we would be growing five tonne. You would need the length of time it takes to tour a small museum to do justice to the instructional talk of Emin and Patsy on the agriculture of drum and tea and the implements required to beat it into submission. It was both entertaining and informative and touched upon the swing plough, the corn fiddle, the bull harrow, the stone roller, mowing with the single horse reaper and these boys, used after your seed potatoes were in the drills, fully manured and ready for nature to do the rest. And then in about six weeks, this saddle harrow was put on top of the drill and it knocked the soil back down. And the reason for it was, uh, was to keep weeds and grass at bay. And if you set the potatoes too early in April mm. and the May frost to come, they'd all die. Aye, the May frost was an enemy. So all your work was for it. Well, yeah. The only thing you could do is if you've seen frost in May, with two brothers down one time, they got up at three o'clock in the morning with a rope and then ten drills, and it's not the frost does the harm, it's the sun. Ah. And took six drills at a time before the sun got up. And what did they do? What did they do? To shake the frost of the... To shake the frost off it? Of so, the, so that the, it wouldn't melt? Yeah, and the down all right. Get away with oh, it. Uh, so it's yeah. not the frost that did the damage. It it's was the, the sun. sun. It was the sun melting the frost. Mm -hmm. right. However varied the tasks they performed, all of these devices had one thing in common. They were pretty useless without that faithful four-legged machine, the horse. I met men before and they worked with horses all of their lives. 
And they said as soon as the tractors came in on the land and the horses had to be all put down, mm-hmm. quite a lot yeah. of them, because there was no market no. for horses all of a sudden, mm-hmm. he said he never enjoyed farming after it. No. It wasn't the same. No, it no. wasn't the same. No. You can sp- it took a pat a horse at the headland where the tractors, there's no... No contact. If you're, no out, contact. If you're out all day with horses, well, company. He said, that's what he said. The, the horse was company for Horsemen were horsemen. Right. Yes. I had two uncles and they were great horsemen. And like, uh, they come to the... Uh, time of uh, their life that they weren't fit okay. for what do you call it but they still kept that 20 horses when they died uh, you couldn't part with the horses couldn't part. and the horses with couldn't. that stage weren't really turning over any no, money no they weren't them. turning over no. money and they but knew they... your voice a mile away of course everybody, they knew everybody mm. I seen me mm. walk on the road at night and the mm. nick you mm. because they know the voice mm. get away you know. oh, yeah. Yeah. The blacksmith. how you doing Patsy yeah. see, you, see you in the morning yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the blacksmith he was a very important man yeah. too yeah. sure right, uh, right. well the blacksmith was there not only to shoe the horses and all the no, rest of it, but kept to keep this stuff to in, keep in the, order. To keep the, the, the implements in order. Right. And there's one last device here that I'd never seen before and didn't even know existed. Needless to say, it too has a connection to horses. You had a man uh, clipping the horse and you had a man twisting, uh, twisting the machine, twisting, twisting. So this is like a, like a barber shop. Yeah, a barber shop, yeah. yeah. Mm. In other words, this, this part can... here... Was if this was going now, you, you, you could do it. I could, I could get uh, a better, could, I could get a better haircut. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I've I seen it happen. Oh, I I've gone. seen it many, many a time. But how, but how did that work? I mean, there's no, there's no electricity or anything. No, like that, that had no. to work from here, Joe. Right. Joe. Yeah, that, that it's yeah, not yeah. working. You see, that yeah. one you kept twisting, twisting, and there's a chain in there that drove the, the clippers here. Have, have you seen that actually work? Oh, I did oh, it myself. I, oh, I clipped yeah. horses myself. Seriously, oh, with this here. Yeah, with And it was effective, was it? Oh, good. Yeah, yeah. Now they have the electric clippers, you know, and yeah. uh, horses. Uh, oh, no, this was per- this was fairly mobile. You could move. Yeah, yeah, you around. moved that around. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. And, was, um, and did it make a lot of noise? Do you remember? Uh, no, 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 it was no. a civil type no. of noise oh, that it made. Yeah. Civil type. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 We'd put it that way. Yeah.